Awesome. Uh, so welcome everyone to our seminar. Uh, the speaker today is Bastian Rieck, and he will tell us about topological graph neural networks. All right. Thank you very much for having me. This is this is a great honor, and it's it's really my pleasure to to give this talk today. And next to what Sarah already said previously, I also want to encourage you, if I'm not making any sense while telling you about something topological or machine learning wise, then just unmute yourself in between, and I'm perfectly happy to have this as an as an interactive uh, conversation. So I'll be talking about topological graph neural networks, and I'm primarily focusing on what we call graph classification. And in graph classification, the main idea is that you're given a graph, such as a molecule or something that arises from, let's say, sensor measurements or um, some other biomedical application. And then you are being tasked with telling me which one of the potential labels the graph should get. So the, the molecule could be flammable, for instance, or it could be water soluble, or it could be drinkable, or it could be harmful or harmless or whatever. So just to, to set the stage for this, this is what we're talking about. There is also an interesting uh, related problem, which is called a node classification, where you're interested in the role of individual nodes of the graph. But the node classification problem is something that we will not be directly talking about in, in this talk. So we will focus on the, on the more global view of graphs here. Anyway, when you're doing machine learning with graphs, you quickly run into very interesting issues. And the primary one of those, I would say, is how to represent graphs. Namely, if you consider two graphs, G and G prime, they can have a different number of vertices. But machine learning algorithms or algorithms in general, they don't tend to like that. So they like representations that are of a fixed length, because then you can use it as a high dimensional vector in some space, or you can throw your, uh, another, another model at it, and so on and so forth. So what we need is we require a vectorized representation, f, that maps the graph from some space, mathcal g, to a high dimensional real valued vector space. I mean, all of this is obviously for convenience reasons, you can find better spaces if you are inclined to do so. But I would say the machine learning community is predominantly following the paradigm of, of just embedding into some high dimensional Euclidean vector space. And the important thing of this embedding is that this representation function needs to be permutation invariant, by which I mean that if I permute the nodes and in my graph, so I give them to you in another order, but the connectivity stays the same, so the topology stays the same, just the numbering is different, then of course your embedding should not change because otherwise you are tied off, you're, you're kind of tied to the initial representation of the data set, and that's not really nice. So let me give you a brief overview of how that was obtained prior to the, let's call it deep learning revolution. And there is this marvelous test um, for <clears throat> graph isomorphism uh, due to uh, Weisfeller and Lehmann. There's a, a very interesting story associated to this. I don't have the time to tell you this, but you can look it up. It's pretty, it's really pretty crazy. Anyway, the idea of this Weisfeller Lehmann or short WL test for graph isomorphism is that you're given a graph and you create a color for each node in the graph. This color could be based on the label of the node or on its degree or on whatever property you want to track. Now you collect those colors of adjacent nodes in a multi-set. So you basically count how many times a certain color occurs. And afterwards you compress these colors plus the node's own color in order to form a new color. So that is that can be seen as some kind of rudimentary hashing scheme. So you take a string or you take a multi-set plus some other element and you return back another element from some predefined set. And now you continue this relabeling scheme until the colors are stable. And you can actually show that the coloring scheme is stable after a certain number of iterations. And now the cool insight is, this was usually meant to be a test for graph isomorphism. We of course know that this is not solvable in polynomial time yet. And so it's a little bit unclear of, of what we would expect here, but we do know that if the compressed labels of the two graphs diverge at any point, so if those sequences are different at any point, then the graphs are guaranteed not to be isomorphic. 
But as with many things in topology or in graph theory, or maybe also in life, the other direction is not valid. So non-isomorphic graphs can give rise to coinciding compressed label sequences. Now, let's take a look at how that works in practice. So just a simple example for one iteration. Just a second. Okay, I hope I was muted there. Anyway, the, let's, let's do this for this simple graph here with seven vertices. So we take a look at each node and we take a look at each node's own label. And now let's take a look at node uh, V3, for instance. And we can see that V3 has a bluish label on its own and it has adjacent labels, uh, three blue labels and one red label. So one red label and one, two, three blue neighbors. And now we take all of these multisets and hash them into a different color. And you can see that same neighborhoods with the same own color and the same adjacent label coloring need to be assigned by necessity by this hashing scheme to the same color. So essentially V1 and V2, which have the same neighborhoods and the same colors, they should be indistinguishable by this coloring scheme. Whereas V3, for instance, which is a little bit different, it has a higher degree, for instance, it gets assigned to a different color. Notice that those colors are, of course, completely random as just an illustration. In practice, you do this by, doing, by using strings or, or integers or something like that. Anyway, we now relabel the graph with these colors. And you can already see that in contrast to having only two colors in step one, you now have more than two. So you start gaining a picture of the, let's call it local slash global information in the graph that you would get when you transport the labels deeper into the graph. So this can be seen as a rudimentary uh, propagation scheme. Now, what is this good for? It's, it was predominantly used uh, before deep learning techniques or before graph neural network techniques in order to get, give you a very nice algorithm for doing graph similarity analysis. Namely, you do this iteration, this WL iteration for a few times, you take a look at the labels that you get and at the counts that you get, and you concatenate all of them into a very, very long vector. And this vector is just a count vector. So it's essentially just a, a number of, 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 of integers. And with this feature vector now, you I have a fixed size feature vector representation that you can calculate for different graphs and whose representations you can compare with whatever means you want to compare them. So for instance, a Euclidean distance or a kernel-based distance measure or whatever you have in mind. So this was a very nice way to, well, to give you, uh, to give you a hint as to how uh, to do graph similarity analysis um, pre-deep learning techniques. So we have one question. Yes. Um, is it a theorem that these iterations are guaranteed to converge? Yes, it is. That's uh, that goes back to the to the fundamental paper by Weisfeller and Lehmann. I don't have this reference with me right now, but it should be linked into uh, in in both of the papers that I have on this slide. I can I can look it up later later though. But there's I should also say on the uh, graph combinatorics level there's some very cool research uh, based on the expressivity. So showing which types of graphs or which, which um, classes of graphs can be distinguished with this test and which cannot. And this is, uh, so there's, there's lots more to, to do here. I'm just showing you kind of the straight road towards, towards machine learning based applications, but there's a wealth of combinatorial research going on here as well. So I can, I can point out uh, other references to you later on. Is that if, if that's okay. There doesn't there doesn't seem to be a complaint. So okay, okay, that's uh, that's great. So this 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 procedure has uh, a lot of beneficial properties, though. So it's really efficient, at least if you have small values of h, so a small number of iterations. If you go to very high numbers, very large numbers of h, then it gets a little bit icky because you have to account for different power sets. So technically, all the label combinations could occur, right? And so you have to you have to account for this and your your feature vectors might become very, very long, but for small numbers, it's, it's certainly sufficient. It also has good empirical performance, by which I mean that it's actually quite capable of telling graphs apart. And it's actually, I would say, still one of the best baseline methods to apply when you want to do graph similarity analysis or graph classification. 
Nowadays, there are also extensions for continuous features. So what you should do or what you could do if you don't have a label at a node, but you have some kind of measured property or even a high dimensional vector at a node. And there's even a topology uh, aware variant that I developed with, um, with my student Christian and with my supervisor Karsten from ETH. The disadvantage of this method, however, is that it's still a static aggregation over neighborhoods. So I give you the graph and you do the same procedure for all the neighbors at the same time, even though some of the neighbors might be very important because some of the nodes might be crucial for the graph, whereas other nodes might not be so crucial because it could be a graph that arises from some measured property of some underlying system. And then you might have some noise in the system and you, you actually don't want to treat this. So this is one of the drawbacks here. And now we're sort of entering the, the modern graph neural network revolution here. And this is based on the- pause with the question? Yes, of course. Yeah, just so a quick question. So um, in the last slide, you mentioned that this is good in telling graphs apart. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering how good is it at seeing that graphs are similar or the same in the sense, how stable is this procedure to maybe subdividing an edge or maybe adding something which we would think is superfluous, um, but maybe it thinks gives you a whole different object? Mm -hmm. I think it's... Um, I think it's not stable to that, to be honest. So I think it's very good in practice uh, and very good for different classes of graphs. So, so for instance, it solves the isomorphism problem for certain graph types, maybe for something like trees. I, I, there's great work, I think, by Kai and Führer um, going, going back a few decades. Um, I, I can look that up. Um, but uh, if you do, let's say, if you do some, some moves like a um, like the opposite of an edge collapse, for instance. So you do something that doesn't change the the Betty numbers, for instance. Uh, this will this will definitely uh, lead to lead to problems because you increase the the counts there. So it is possible to to lead this this algorithm astray. Okay, that's a, that's that's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> of course. All right. So now to to address some of these issues, the the last few years focused predominantly on message passing methods in graphs. So here the idea is that you take a graph and you have a, a high dimensional attribute vector. So if you have only labels, you can use a one hot encoding, for instance, and you go to a node, for instance, V4 here, and you take a look at its neighbors, V2, V3, V5. And then you take all the information that you have, all the attributes that you have at this point, and you aggregate them with some aggregation function. This aggregation function, for instance, could be a sum or a mean function or something, something even more complex if you want that. And if you repeat this process multiple times and combine the resulting representations that you get, so the resulting high dimensional vectors with a simple concatenation function, for instance, then you also get a scheme that is iterative, and that starts to accumulate information from deep into the graph. And you can even get a graph level representation if you use what people now call a, so a readout function. The readout function is akin to, for instance, another mean function that takes all the nodes in your graph and assigns them to their mean. So that way you gain a fixed size vector, fixed high dimensional vector for every graph. And that's the I would say primary ingredient that makes graph neural networks fly in this case, because when you do the aggregation, you can assign different weights to different vectors. So you can, as they say in the machine learning parlance, you can learn uh, the relevance of different uh, neighbors and of different nodes in your graph with a task-based uh, objective function. Now, Let's go briefly over this. So the graph neural network slides in a nutshell with apologies to, to anyone who thinks that this is not enough. The basic idea of a GNN is to learn better aggregation schemes by learning hidden node representations, HV, based on some aggregated attribute vectors, AV. And these attribute vectors are aggregated over neighborhoods, as I showed you before, so with this message passing procedure. And if you do k iterations, then you essentially get information from up to k hops away. So the more iterations you do, the deeper you can go into the graph. And now if you repeat this procedure big k times, then you can gain an overall representation of your graph. Now, this has been studied uh, quite a lot. There's a 
nice foundational paper, which I would recommend for you to read if you're interested in this. It's called How Powerful Are Graph Neural Networks? This introduced this nice terminology and also some ideas of how to, how to improve it and how to link it back to the aforementioned WL algorithm. Now, what's the status quo with this? Well, so far I haven't really talked about topology, right? But graphs are still topological objects. And it turns out that GNNs, so graph neural networks, and the WL test itself are both incapable of recognizing certain topological structures. We'll see a very nice example of this later on. So the natural question for, for, for me and my collaborators was, what can we actually gain when imbuing them with more knowledge about the topology? Now, this is obviously AATRN, so I don't need to tell you a lot about topological features, but let's just walk through that so we can see what we are, so that we're all on the same page here. So given this graph, I'm talking predominantly about connected components for now and cycles with the understanding that we could pick different representatives of the cycles. So actually we're not, we're not even looking at the representatives now, nowadays, but don't, don't tell anyone. Uh, and we could go higher, of course, we could look at click complexes of those graphs as well. But for now, we just stay with Betty zero and Betty one. Now we also all know how persistent homology works. The intuition here is that we pick some ordering of the edges of the nodes and the vertices as well, but it looks a little bit nicer if I don't let the vertices pop up here as well. We pick some, some ordering and we go over this ordering and we check what happens with respect to the connected components and the cycles. So we check at which of these insertion operations a connected component is uh, created or destroyed by merging it with another one or where a cycle is created, such as in this example here. And to make sure that they're all destroyed, we assign them some finite value in the persistence diagram to make, to make this work and to make the machine learning algorithm happy and also to make ourselves happy, right? Because it is hard to, to represent otherwise. I know that there are ways around this with extended persistence and whatnot, but the easiest approach and the easiest recipe for now is to just set them to some high value to, to what we call in our paper a dummy value. Now, being all on the same page here, we also all know that the choice of filtration is critical for what we get. I mean, of course, if we're interested in Betty numbers, we will get the right Betty numbers of the graph eventually, but Betty numbers of a graph can also be calculated quite easily without having to go through this whole uh, process of, of filtrating it, right? But if we pick the right filtration, we also know that we see a little bit more. So for instance, contrast, those two filtrations here. They start a little bit the same, but then you add almost the whole graph structure in step three for the first filtration, so for the upper one, and you have a little bit more graph structure for the lower one. Now, of course, which filtration is right and which isn't, that depends a little bit on your, on your application, on, on what you want to see in the end, but it's abundantly clear, or it's at least becoming abundantly clear, I think, to, to practitioners that the right choice of filtration decides a lot about what you can actually see with, with persistent homology in the end. And so it was quite natural that, that one should explore this and not going too much into the details of this paper, but in a, in a previous work or in a, in a precursor work to, to, the, to the paper that I'm going to show you later, um, Christoph, Florian, Mark, uh, Roland and I, already figured out how to do graph filtration learning. So we were able to learn a filtration that is dependent on the outcome on an objective function. Now, we did this by cheating a little bit, uh, in, by which I mean that we, that we actually used a graph neural network to initialize our filtration function. So again, the, the, the exact details are not super important here, but I want to give you an intuitive feeling for this. So we start with some graph and we use this graph neural network approach or so this message passing approach in order to uh, do some, some message passing and initialize the weights of our filtration function F here. And if we have this initial function F, then we start training our, our classifier and, and make the weights changeable of this function. So this is best shown in the picture. We call this a readout function based on persistent homology. So we start with our message passing based on the learned filtration function or on the random filtration function. And by applying persistent homology to these values, we obtain persistence diagrams. Now we take those persistence diagrams and embed them into 
a higher dimensional space using an embedding function psi that I will show you on the next slide. And this embedding function has the property that it's end-to-end -end trainable. So it has weights that can be trained by a neural network. If we throw it at a, at a deep neural network with some loss term L, which depends on the task. So this could, for instance, be binary cross entropy uh, for a graph classification or whatever you had in mind. Could even be a regression task if you're interested in this. If you don't want to do graph classification, but graph regression, for instance, when you want to predict a certain scalar property of a graph, that could, that could also well work. The important thing is that we can make all of this differentiable, namely, uh, since the function psi and the neural network are differentiable and the loss term is also differentiable, we definitely have gradient information going from this loss term back to the embedding function psi. So that is the whole revolution of, of deep learning that it was possible to back propagate gradients through a neural network, even though it was a super deep neural network. But what we saw yeah, is, yes. May I ask a question just to of make course. sure I'm understanding? So the learn filtration, you're not backpropping through all the way to the learn filtration here? Not yet. Wait a second. <laughs> Sorry, was, I'm impatient. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I was gonna I was gonna say what we showed in this paper is that this other gradient also exists under certain conditions. And so the conditions are essentially that the values at the vertices of the graph be uh, be unique so that we have an injective filtration function so that no two vertices should be assigned the same uh, the same function value. Um, we were thus able to adjust the original filtration values of the graph in order to create a filtration that is task dependent and that can be adjusted uh, to a certain objective. So for instance, to do graph classification. That, does that kind of answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Sorry for <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> jumping in. No, no, it's, it's all good. I mean, you, you, you kind of anticipated what we, what we wanted to do, and this is, this is perfect. I mean, I should also state that this is, this is the, the, the preliminary work or the, the, the precursor work to what I'm about to show you next, because um, the, the flip side of this approach is that, well, maybe, Maybe let's first let's first finish discussing this before before we before we before we go into um, why we why we did it that way. Um, um, one tiny little detail that I want to that I want to show you here is that this uh, graph filtration learning works because there is a differentiable coordinatization function. So this this psi function that takes a diagram and maps it to real value. And if we do if we have um, n copies of psi with different embedding parameters, then we obtain an embedding into an n-dimensional vector space, which is still end-to-end -end trainable. And this embedding function is essentially just, just a projection function with uh, having a set of trainable parameters. So that was kind of the, the gist or the, the insight that we had for this paper, that taking the persistence diagram and turning it into a nicer representation that can be trained end-to-end -end makes, makes this whole uh, filtration learning feasible. Now, the flip side of this is that it actually does not really inform the graph neural network itself. So it uses one, one specific type of graph neural network to initialize the filtration values. And that is, that is really good. But then the, the network is, is in, in a way, it's cut loose, right? So you don't imbue the network with information about the graph itself, but you just say, OK, having obtained an initial function, I now adjust that function so that it works. But what we want to do, since we want to help practitioners and help graph neural networks be more aware of topological features, we want to have a layer that is a kind of module that we could put into the machine learning algorithm in order to make the full graph neural network aware of the topological features. And that is what we did in the, in the follow-up work. So this is the, the spiritual predecessor, uh, the, pardon me, the spiritual successor of, of this work. It's still, it's already on archive. It's um, great work with Max, Edward, Michael, Eve, and Carson. Max and Michael are uh, almost finished with their PhD. Well, in Max, Max is just finishing and Michael already handed in uh, two days ago. So really happy to, to see that this, that this was also part of, of a great PhD journey. And uh, the fundamentally new thing that we did here is that we have multiple filtrations that we're learning. So we're saying, 
oh, well, it's not enough to learn a single filtration that we then, then adjust with an objective function later on, but we want to have multiple filtrations. Now, before some of you perk up, we haven't actually solved differentiable multi-filtration learning, unfortunately. So those filtrations are learned individually. So essentially it's, it's, a, it's a set of copies that, that we're learning with different parameters, but we're not learning any interactions between the filtrations themselves. That would be a very nice next step. And if some of you have an idea how to, how to adjust this, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to discuss it. Um, the second fundamental change here is that this is a kind of building block that can be inserted into a neural network without the neural network being aware of it. By which I mean that we don't really change anything in terms of dimensionality of the inputs or the outputs. So the input of that layer is a d-dimensional vector and we make sure that the output of the vector is also a d-dimensional vector, which has some included information about the, uh, the topology in the, in the graph. But the, the reason why I'm, why I'm, um, why I'm drilling this, this point in so much is that this makes it generally applicable. So essentially what we can do with this layer is we can take any graph neural network architecture and there, there are multiple architectures which differ in expressive power and in the amount of compute power needed and in the way that they conceptually address graph learning. But we can take any of those architectures, we can remove one of their layers and replace it by this layer. And the graph neural network is essentially none the wiser, so it still works, but it's now suddenly aware of topological features. We will see that this, that this can, can lead to, to quite nice results. So the, the other technical thing that is, that is different here is that we start with the node attributes of the graph. So remember that those are the, the node attributes that are learned during message passing. We now have a node map phi that maps these d-dimensional vectors to a k-dimensional vector space. So this is essentially the, the step in which we create k different filtrations of the graph, phi being a somehow differentiable function, of course. We now get these diagrams here, and we use the aforementioned coordinatization function psi to create some compatible representations of the node attributes. And then we just concatenate these node representations with the original node features and obtain another output x tilde, which is also living in, uh, in d-dimensional space again. So as I said, d-dimensional input goes in and d-dimensional output comes out. So we can essentially replace all the layers in the network and this will still, this will still work. Of course, honestly, to, to anticipate some of your questions, maybe it makes the whole training process slower because this whole calculation is still not parallelized, whereas the predominant graph neural network training libraries, they are heavily parallelized and it's heavily optimized code. So we don't have an optimized implementation for this, but the, the training process still works. So it's not, we, we, haven't, we haven't really created a monster here that, that doesn't work at all. If I may interrupt again yes, on the previous slide. Um, so it kind of feels like an auto encoder here. Um, if instead of trying to aggregate at the end the features via concatenation, if instead you were trying to relearn the like node labels, then it would feel very much like an auto encoder. Does my analogy make sense to you? That's yeah, that's a, that's a really good analogy. Um, I haven't actually thought about it like like this. So, but you're right. I mean, we we could we could essentially also change the dimensionality in between. And, and just blow it up later on. So we could essentially enforce a dimensionality reduction of those, of those vectors and blow them up later on. The only thing that we have to do is if we want to remain compatible with the existing architecture, we need to ensure that we don't change the output dimensionality. But you're right, we could, we could have, have a, a bottleneck layer in here. So a, a layer that, that compresses the dimension to, to some more manageable size. I'm not, right, and no. oh, go ahead. I was going to say that I'm not sure whether we actually experimented with this. I can look this up in the code later on. So we had a lot of additional experiments where we where we play around with how to solve this node mapping here, for instance. And we also experimented with different coordinatization functions. So the differentiable choice that I showed you here, this turned out to be 
to be a really good choice, but there are also other functions available in the literature. And in, in, the, in most of the experimental setup, we actually let the network decide itself which function it should use by, by doing cross-validation and checking which, which um, outputs uh, yield, uh, yield better performance. Um, but yeah, but for the, for the purpose of this talk, it's more pedagogical to, to just have as a, one single coordinatization function here. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. By analogy, with the autoencoder case, I was just thinking like, if you approach it that way, then you're bullying your two embedding layers here to essentially compress the representation of those original node attributes via this persistent structure, which I think is just really interesting in general of like how much of this persistent structure can learn the message passing node attributes. Anyway, yep. that's that was <laughs> what sparked. No, but that's 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 a good point. So, I mean, in general, um, I can I can go into the nitty gritty details later on. But one thing that we observed is that this in most of the data sets that we tried this on, this works um, extremely nicely. But there are some data sets where it somehow doesn't train as well as before. And now we are feeling a little bit like alchemists, honestly, because we don't really know what is going on. I mean, on the surface level, those data sets are exactly the same. So it has to be some kind of intrinsic property that we're not aware of. Maybe it's the size, who knows, but this could shed some light on this. Maybe maybe we are too generous with our representation. Maybe we should force it to, to uh, be a little bit more compressed here. So that's, that's a really good point. But anyway, I'm going to move on because I want to um, I want to show you some nice results and also some some theoretical nuggets. So one of the theoretical nuggets that we were able to uncover for this paper is that we were actually able to show that uh, persistent homology is at least as expressive as the standard weisfeller lehmann test for graph isomorphism, commonly abbreviated as WL1. So we were able to show that if there is a set of WL1 label sequences for two graphs. And if they diverge, then there exists an injective filtration such that the corresponding persistence diagrams in dimension zero are also not equal. That was a pretty, that was a pretty nice result already because it, it sort of establishes that persistent homology can bring something to the table or can, can enhance the expressivity. I mean, for now we, for this slide, we, we know that, that it's at least as expressive as WL, but of course you might anticipate where this is going. And the, the proof sketch, I'm not going into the details here due to time reasons, but the proof sketch for this theorem is that we first show how to construct an appropriate filtration function F from a WL1 labeling sequence. But then we are faced with the choice or with the, with the dilemma that F is typically not injective. And so we cannot really say that it's that it yields to that leads to a differentiable representation and so we show that there is an injective function f tilde which is as you might guess arbitrarily close to f and whose corresponding persistence diagrams also uh, do not coincide and that kind of solves uh, this dilemma for us and so we're able to show that if we have a wl label sequence that diverges then we can also get or at least there is there exists a filtration that does the same thing for us. Now, the elephant in the room is, of course, whether we are able to learn this, this filtration always. And that is something that we, that we cannot answer. We can only answer this empirically for now, but we at least know that there is an existence proof now. But the other side is even more interesting. And maybe some of you guessed where this is going, but there are actually non-isomorphic graphs that the simple WL1 test cannot distinguish but persistent homology can distinguish quite easily. So the simplest example of those graphs would be the two triangles and the hexagon. So the two triangles on the left-hand side, they have two connected components and two cycles. So their Betty numbers are two and two respectively. The graph on the right-hand side, however, only has a single connected component and a single cycle. So Betty numbers of one and one respectively. So quite trivially, dare I say it here, uh, these, these two graphs are different and they are distinguished uh, by, by persistent homology and even by, by ordinary homology, as I should stress. But if you, if you, do, this for the, if you do this with the WL test, you will quickly run into, into issues. And I will actually pick this up in a few slides when we discuss our synthetic examples. So since the node degree of all these graphs is the same, 
WL is actually incapable of distinguishing between the two of them. So it cannot tell you something about the presence of cycles or connected components. That's something that we already observed in, in earlier work empirically, where we saw that the inclusion of cycles somehow makes a topology aware variant of WL a little bit better in terms of empirical performance. But now we also have a very nice uh, theoretical assessment of this as well. Now, I can ask another quick question. Yes, of course. If you yeah, go back one slide, if that's okay. This one or uh, uh, just the prior one, actually. Yeah. So, um, is there a reason here why it's important for the filtration to be injective? I mean, I do understand for the gradients to exist, but there's yeah. also you could also have subgradients that exist even without. You're, you're right. Um, this was more a this was more a convenience choice because. The theorem, as it was formulated in graph filtration learning, requires this, this injectivity. Uh, and it makes the case that if you don't have injective filtration function values, then at some points you, your gradient is, well, you, you, you don't have a unique choice for um, um, at, in, in, in some of the cases. And so the, the original theorem from the graph filtration learning paper suggested that one should have injectivity at the, at the filtration values. And so this is why we try to correctly align those two theorems but you're right it's not it's technically not necessary okay that's interesting thank you of course so um let's talk a little bit about experiments and i don't want to bore you with too many numbers but i think that this is this is uh, somehow interesting what we what we did in the end so we take existing graph neural network architectures we replace one layer by our topological graph uh, neural network layer which we call toggle uh, and we measure the predictive performance. And now we have three different facets to this, which I find fascinating. So the first one is we look at some th synthetic data sets. Now, reviewers and some readers in machine learning, they might not appreciate that because they think that, of course, synthetic data sets are generated such that a certain method looks good, which is certainly uh, the case to, to some extent, right? Because we want to showcase what we can do. So we picked some data sets or we created some data sets that have topological information in it and that cannot be easily distinguished by graph neural networks otherwise. The second part of this is that we also assess predictive performance on data sets without having informative node features. The plan being here that we wanted to look at how good can we be if we only have topological information available. And the third one is the usual table that you would find in a machine learning paper, namely we assess the predictive performance on graph benchmark data sets. So the, the, whole, the whole spectrum of experiments is covered with this. Now, as for the synthetic data sets, uh, we created two types of data sets. One is called cycles for obvious reasons. The other one, well, is called necklaces because it kind of looks like a necklace that you can take on and, and off again. Both are binary classification problems. So we can generate the same number of graphs for each one of these classes. And as you can see, they don't look particularly challenging. So as a human being, you would be able to tell them apart, I guess, but they are challenging to detect with standard graph neural networks and for the WL test. Now, let's take a look at why this is the case. So here, this is a great visualization created by, by Max, my, my co-author and student. Um, if you do the WL test, if you perform the WL test on this data set, you will find that you, are essentially always counting the same node labels. So the node label histograms, they look exactly the same. And so the WL test is incapable of um, telling these graphs apart, because as I said, all the nodes have the same uh, have the same node degree. And so you cannot detect that there are different connected components or different cycles going on. Now, this leads, of course, to some very interesting performance results. So you can see that the original WL scheme based on the node degrees stays at roughly 50% accuracy. So it's just flipping a coin. You can also see that persistent homology, of course, P, um, abbreviated with pH. So a fixed filtration based on the node degrees is actually pretty good here. This is, of course, as we would expect, because we can, we can see that the that the number of cycles or the number of connected components is different. So it would be weird if we would be unable to tell those two classes of graphs apart. Now, a standard GCN with K layers um, is performing very badly at the beginning. But if you add more layers, it also starts performing better. This is due to the fact that if you increase the number of layers, you also increase kind of the receptive field of the, of the graph neural network. And 
we have some experimental uh, difference here. So usually people state that uh, GNN is as expressive as the WL test. And this would look weird here because suddenly you have a case where the WL test fails completely and the GNN is actually pretty good. This can be explained quite easily by the fact that the GCN network here for training purposes has access to random node features. And so it can leverage somehow this, this randomness and this the weighting function between different nodes. And so it can actually learn something about the graph structure if the number of layers is sufficiently high. And the, the theorems that connect expressivity of GNNs and WL, they only talk about the case where the feature space is discrete. But here we have two different feature spaces. So we have one continuous feature space. And on the other side for the WL test, we have a discrete feature space. So just to make, to make this clear, because this was surprising to us and we thought that, well, what is, what is going on here? But yeah, bottom line is that it works as expected. So um, we don't need a lot of layers to get good performance here. So now let's take a look at the second data set here, the necklaces, again, nice visualization due to due to Max, so you can follow this along, but I'm not going to comment it too much. It just shows you the different iterations and the different histograms that you get when you go deeper into the graph with the WL test. And the message that this should send to you, so it's also kind of message passing, is that these histograms are always the same. So again, you would not expect that WL is really capable of performing uh, that well. Now you can see that this is sort of the case. Notice that it's, it's becoming a little bit better if you go very, very deeply into the graph because we have different variants of the necklaces actually, and some of them can be told apart um, by the WL test, but only for very, very high uh, iterations of, of the graph. Um, now, a little bit of a different story with persistent homology. So if you use persistent homology and just the degree, then you see that you end up with a sort of similar performance here. Uh, the GCN requires a lot of layers to reach very good performance in distinguishing them. But the GCN with one layer of, of topology, with, a, with one layer of toggle, I should say, uh, reaches quite high performance here. So this additional view of having trainable filtrations really helps in extracting topological structures from, from a data set. That should be the takeaway message of, of this slide. And now let's move briefly on to the second part of the experiment, which I also like very much. This is where we took some data sets from the community and we just removed the existing node features. So we, we knew that existing data sets tended to leak some information into the node attributes. And this of course decreases the utility of topological features. By this, I mean the following situation. Suppose you're given a molecule and now I give you the labels of the molecule, such as this is a carbon atom or this is a hydrogen atom, something like this. If you know that this is a carbon atom, you you can be reasonably sure that this might form a ring there, right? So having knowledge about the labels in the graph or the node features themselves, because sometimes they can also be higher dimensional, they can also they can already be very much entangled with topology. So Often in those data sets, the node features were created by some external procedure, which already imbues them with some prior knowledge from the person, well, labeling the graphs essentially, or labeling the individual nodes. And so they are not distinct or not independent or disentangled to use some, some machine learning to, uh, terminology. They're not disentangled from the actual topology of the graph. And so they make it possible for a, for GCN to or for GNN to pick up much more structural information than it should actually be able to uh, to extract. To counteract this, we just re removed those node attributes and replaced them by random noise. And so, in in this sense, all the all the methods should be on equal footing because they can only use the, the structural, that is, the topological information of the graph, in order to do some predictions. And what we now did is we compared the original version of a graph neural network with a version in which we replaced the second layer of that architecture by toggle. So this is why it looks a little bit weird. We have, for instance, a GCN4, which is a standard graph convolutional network with four layers. And in GCN3, toggle one, this means that we replaced the second layer of that architecture by toggle. We also have additional experiments. If you're now wondering why the second layer, well, in the end, it 
didn't turn out to, to matter that much, but we have additional experiments that show that this, that this choice is, is at least reasonable in that it gives you one graph neural network layer, which can already learn something about the graph. And then you have the topology layer, which in, informs the rest of the, of the pipeline. Whereas if you had it at the very end, it's a little bit different. Um, well, as I said, we have some more experiments in, in the appendix of this paper, if you're, if you're interested in this. Also do feel uh, free to, to reach out to me if you have more questions about this, of course. Now, what we can see here with the usual notation in machine learning is that um, we bolded the best comparison partner of every row. So you can see that at least for the GCN, adding topology in this experiment always helps. Sometimes you even gain uh, up to uh, up to up to 10 percentage points in, in predictive accuracy just by virtue of having access to topological features. With other architectures, it's a little bit different. So the GIN architecture, was, which was specifically developed in order to show that you can have more expressive graph neural networks, this one actually fares quite well on its own. So the, the gains are really not that substantial in most of the um, in most of the data sets, but still the, the gains are there and it's it's kind of a proof of concept of what topology can do for you. So it's not, it's not meant to, to outperform everything because one, one nice property of this type of experimental setup is that we essentially keep all the architectures at the same size. So our layer has approximately the same number of parameters than the previous, than the, than the layer that it replaces. And so we are really comparing apples and apples and we're not comparing a very small graph neural network with a very, very big graph neural network. So I want to stress this because if your takeaway message from this is that, that it doesn't really help that much in practice, then this might be the wrong takeaway message. Um, I'm guessing that if one would really, really dig into this and maybe also develop other embedding functions or maybe play a little bit more with, with the aforementioned or the, the suggested bottleneck, for instance, then this could probably go, go even higher. But that was not the express purpose here. Here it was more about saying, what do you get when you just replace it, when you swap it out? Um, and last, for the GAT, uh, the graph attention uh, network, um, we observed the highest gains, essentially, at least in, 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 in a few of the data sets. Um, but you can also see that this is the problem child that I mentioned before. The enzymes data set really has some, some weird things going on. We don't, we don't get it to fit other, other networks, as you will see on the next slides. They are, they are much, much better uh, than, than this here. Anyway. Um, I would summarize this as it works quite well when you only have topological information available. But now let's take a look at what you get when you have more than that available. So when we just take the original benchmark data set, we don't replace anything and we just take a look at what we can get when we uh, apply our architecture here. So now the picture, picture is a little bit more, more mixed. Um, for instance, you can see that the most, I'm not sure, I, I would say that this is the most modern architecture here, the gated GCN architecture, which has some additional attention mechanisms and things like this. This performs really, really well on its own. Um, the, none, of the, none of the topology aware variants, is, uh, except for the, for the GIN variant, are really outperforming all the other um, graph neural networks on these, on these data sets, but at least the thing that we observed before, so this outperforming of their non-topology aware variant, that still, that still happens in most of the cases. So the overall takeaway for, from us was that we can still gain substantial increases in predictive accuracy if we add some topological information, but we cannot force a network that doesn't perform well before. We cannot force this to be now the best performing network of, of the bunch. So this is probably caused by the fact that those benchmark data sets are not really that big. So you can see that in some cases you have up to four or five percentage points or even more of standard deviation. And so of course it's quite unclear of whether you're actually able to, to have a statistically significant performance difference here. But again, takeaway should be that this can be useful and this, that this uh, imbues a network with more expressivity the takeaway shouldn't be that we now outperform everything all across the board because there's also some hidden dangers lurking there, right? I mean, one of the issues being that it's quite unclear whether those data sets have been collected for the purpose of evaluating such, uh, such graph neural network algorithms in, in practice anyway. So 
um, as a as a last slide about about the um, uh, about the experimental comparison, I want to show you that it also performs quite well in contrast to existing topology-based methods. For this, we also wanted to remain super fair, and so we we used a very very small GCN architecture with a single very small layer of toggle in order to to check this because otherwise it would be a little bit weird if if one of the competitor methods has hundred thousands of parameters and we come at it with millions of parameters, right? But again. We also observe these beneficial results. So having a fully trainable representation where the GCN is actually being embedded and not just being used as an initializer is also beneficial. Now, as the last slide, I just want to show you something very, very nice, uh, which we always get asked by, by reviewers, um, namely, what types of filtrations can we actually learn? Isn't this just learning a degree filtration? Now, what we did here is we scaled the nodes by the degree and we colored them according to the function value that they learn. And those are three examples. So you can see that um, the resulting filtrations that we get for one of the graphs, they are quite different and they capture different aspects of the graph. Now, what aspects those are, we honestly don't know because this would require more information and more interpretability analysis of the, of the resulting filtrations. But we are happy to see that at least it's not just repeating the degree filtration, but it's actually picking up on some additional signal in the graph. And maybe, for instance, it would be interesting to check uh, to what extent we are mimicking a heat kernel here or mimicking some other property that has been previously used to do a static filtration on the graph. And that's it from my side. So I want to close with a, with a few thoughts. Where, where do we actually go from here? So both as AATRN, but also in, as, as, as machine learners. So one of the nicest adages that I think applies in many of, our, of, of my research, at least, is if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I have the feeling that these data sets that we're looking at, they might actually stymie progress in GNN research, because as we showed in our first experiment, where we removed the structure information, um, just classifying them with a, and, and getting to high predictive accuracy later on, that does not require necessarily require structural information. So essentially, we might have graph data sets that are not graphical in nature, if you, if you know what I mean. So all the information might be rather contained in the node features themselves and in the distribution of node features rather than in the actual connectivity. And that would, of course, be problematic because then you're optimizing in the wrong direction because you're developing methods that can leverage those features a little bit better rather than developing methods that are capable of leveraging underlying structural features, right? Nevertheless, uh, I think that higher order structures such as cliques can be crucial for, discern for discerning between different graphs. There's some exciting work by, by Michael Bronstein's group going on. So Michael Bronstein from Twitter Research, he has, um, I think, a recent preprint or even paper out now on, uh, the, on leveraging uh, click information in order to imbue graph neural networks with more information. Um, yeah, anyway, um, the other thing that we want to that we want to take a look at is whether a proper integration into some GIN architectures, so architectures that are that are provably more expressive, whether that could be made somehow smarter or whether that would be somehow smarter. For instance, with the with the ideas that were also raised in uh, in this talk now, but there's also other things that we could try out, such as different embedding functions um, and, and whatnot. Um, on the theoretical side, I would be very interested in learning more about how to learn the filtration functions. So could we state some conditions under which we're guaranteed to learn them? And last, of course, what do we actually gain from learning a filtration function? I mean, we can show empirically that this is nice and, and all that, but is there is there maybe a fundamental approach that we could um, follow in order to, to say something about the, the overall expressivity or the overall um, well, classes of graphs that we can distinguish only by, by learning something. So uh, that's all I have. I'm really, again, thankful for the, uh, for the invite and thanks for your attention. And thank you also very much to all the great collaborators. I mean, I, I already showed them before. I just realized that I don't have a big acknowledgement slides here, but I, I'm certainly grateful that we, that we work together on these projects and I'm happy to take more questions now. Perhaps before we take more questions, I would ask everyone to un unmute themselves so that we can thank Bastian. <laughs> thank you.
And I think we have time for one more question uh, so that we end on the hour. Any more questions or <laughs> there were a lot of lively discussions during the talk, so maybe. <laughs> I have one quick question. I, I felt like I had too many questions, but if I'm allowed one more question. So in terms of learning and filtration, so uh, I'm wondering if you thought about uh, at all about the following. So there's always, a if you have a graph, um, there's always a filtration you can associate to every point, which is the distance from that point. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, that's somehow a, like a point signature, right? And the question is, um, that's canonical, I mean, in a certain sense, you're not really learning it. Uh, it's just depend on the structure of the graph. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is yeah. your intuition that something like that could be useful um, in terms of aggregating information at a node? But potentially, yes. I mean, the this is kind of like uh, picking out a source vertex, right, and then then looking at at all the distances that you get from with respect to that vertex, right, and of course. That would actually fit very nicely into our framework by saying, okay, we, we just do this for all the vertices that are in the graph. Um, and so we, we get a multi-perspective of the graph. Um, what I'm not sure is how to make this computationally feasible here in this, in, this, uh, in this framework, because if we have super large graphs, then we also need to make sure that we, that we don't have to calculate all pairs and all shortest paths between them, right? Um, but I think right. that, this, that, this could be really, that this could be really useful and, and expressive. And I mean, there's, there is some evidence in the graph kernels world. So these are other similarity measures um, for graphs that I haven't talked about here, unfortunately, um, that these uh, shortest path uh, kernels, as they are called, might, might be really, really useful in, in uh, assessing the similarities, just that they're super hard to calculate in practice. Makes sense. OK, thank you for the, for the answer. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks again for the wonderful talk. So I'm going to stop the recording here.